Okay, uh, oops, very strong, welcome. Welcome this evening and um, welcome Frank Barker. It's um, my delight and honor to welcome you back. Um, I was thinking these days as one, as one comes out of the, how the main train station in Berlin, um, one immediately faces two um, pristine buildings on the other side. Um, they, these are the T Tour Total building from 2012. Uh, it's an office high rise. And the, is this correctly pronounced? Monet? Monet. Monet, like oui. the French. Oui. oui. It's not quite evident from the spelling. But um, the Tour Total from 2012 and the Monet. Uh, four from 2015, last year. Delicate, finely articulated facades that set up an intriguing dialogue between the two buildings. A sort of rhythmic pulse with subtle counterpoints on a formal geometric level, as well as in terms of material and structural solutions. One, Tour Total, um, in a, with a load-bearing and faceted precast concrete elements, and the other, the Monet, with a lightweight, and I quote, a lightweight curtain wall, a second facade layer veiling the underlying organizational structure, with a curtain wall made from extruded aluminum fins cut, uh, cut in an array of profiles. Now, these are examples of recent work by Michael Leibinger, an office co-founded in 1993 by Frank and his partner, Regina Leibinger. And I think one of the finest offices working in Germany uh, at the, um, right today. And that work, whose achievement Niklas Mark in Frankfurt Allgemeine, Niklas was also a, um, a guest professor here in the architecture class a few years ago. And he has assessed the work as the dissolution of a flat facade to a sculptural volumetric surface making that mediates between the interior and the exterior. Hal Foster, the art critic and theorist, and um, in a essay that was in the book Spielraum, 2014, Hatje and um, which also is the same as the title of today, tonight's lecture. And Foster sees the work as inventive and playful, and that Marco Leibinger's engagement with technology, I would think, is uh, with technology and materials, is, I believe, a, a very fine tempered approach. And in such a sense that the office pursues what Hal Foster calls position of a style. And I think this is important because it's basically. Uh, an engagement with formal design strategies, but without succumbing to the very often um, um, extravagant production of form, uh, a gymnastics of form for, so to speak, form's sake, that has plagued so much of architecture in so many years now. And I think it's undeniable that the work of Barco Leibinger comes forth in a beautiful balancing act. On one side, between on one side simplicity and straightforwardness, a straightforwardness that um, I believe is the same as what Foster calls legibility. And on the other side, a sophistication and refinement in making as well as in composition. It is perhaps the result of what the office itself call, calls a discursive, research-based approach to architectural design. Now, this is just as a very short general background about the office. It's, uh, it's work that I, it's admirable, and I look very much forward, like everyone else, to see it. Frank was born in America. He did his um, bachelor degree at Montana University in 82. He then went to Harvard and did his GSD masters in 1990. Uh, this is also where he uh, met and teamed up with um, his partner, Regine Leibinger. He's been teaching in um, institutions all over the place, um, 
EPFL visiting professor in 2010, University of Wisconsin 2008, and GSD um, 2008, 4, and in 2000 as well. The AA, Cornell, and without also going further into a list of all the um, wonderful buildings, I, it is arguably so that they rose to international recognition with a series of buildings in the mid to late, um, um, from 2005 to 2010. This included a, a, a collection of buildings for the Rumpf campus, campus in South Germany, um, the Gatehouse and the Campus Restaurant 2007 and 8 respectively, both with um, extraordinary roof structures, one counter levered and the other one with a very um, beautiful um, and extravagant Currently designed um, roof structure, as much as a development center in 2009, and not to forget also the True Tech building in South Korea, whose facade is um, known in publications all over the place. That was in 2006. And this is a recognition, I believe, also that is exemplified by the office now just having completed, and Frank was just at the opening in London for the. Serpentine Summer House 2016, one of four designs which expands on the program for the renowned annual Serpentine Pavilion. The work, and to complete somehow the introduction on, on the formal level, the work has uh, naturally, you can imagine, appeared in um, exhibitions everywhere. In the German Architectural Museum, um, also for the um, exhibition called The Pavilion, Pleasure and Polemics in Architecture, where also the Stellenschule Architecture class made a contribution. And um, it was in the Architecture Biennale in 2008 and 2014. The work is included both in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, as much as over here um, in the museum. And Barker Leibinger has won numerous prizes, too many to um, also to list both for buildings, um, urban design proposals, um, but perhaps mentioned just briefly, no less than three times national AIA honor awards for architecture, um, the prestigious Marcus Prize, and um, just recently, Industrie Bas Prize, uh, 2016, uh, stronghold also in their portfolio. Frank, it's an honor to have you here, and I welcome you back. Thanks, Johan. That was a fantastic uh, introduction. You covered a lot of bases, so um, it's fantastic to be back here. Um, it's one of my favorite schools in the world uh, for the design culture, um, but also for the beers that you can get for one euro uh, out of the Automat, and it's a big plus. Um, as Johan was sort of introducing, um, Spielraum was a, a monograph we did with uh, Zach Keys doing the graphics uh, and had to count a couple, about a year and a half ago, I guess we came out with it. But it was actually, you know, rather than doing a book as a kind of uh, chronological listing of projects you did, we, we tried to organize it into a series of work areas and particularly around this uh, idea that um, Johan was talking about that how this idea of, of bricolage um, as a way of working. So in a way I wanted to organize uh, the lecture somewhat loosely around um, this idea. This is the quote that, that Johan was just um, talking about, but um, is really about this idea about the, the practice being a research practice, also academic, and being able to maneuver between these kinds of poles, the academic teaching, which is important to both Regina and myself, um, the idea of a research uh, component uh, that has a certain amount of autonomy in the practice and then the idea of a building practice in itself and how these things uh, relate to each other. So, um, in a way, the book does start with this fabrication research, which is something we've been working on pretty intensely for the last um, 10 years. Again, the idea of the fabrication is not simply to do it, but uh, it really goes back to our education at the Harvard GSD, particularly under Rafael Meneo's um, GSD, uh, where uh, materializing a project was sort of key to sort of how you drive an architectural project. So 
Um, this is sort of a mantra that we've continued into the practice, but this, this idea of treatment of, of material. So uh, the other thing that does is it, 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 you know, it kind of makes research uh, the kind of production of your own building catalog. Um, or the idea of an atlas is another term we use, or uh, an archive. Um, when we started working in Germany, you know, I guess you know, almost 20 years ago, um, our first projects, even though we were based in, in um, Berlin, we weren't really privy to this discussion of a really urban discussion. And much of our early work was industrial uh, building um, factories, which was kind of a funny thing. You know, if you think about Bauhaus or some of these historical orientations um, and how important they were uh, for the development of modernism in Germany in the early 20th century. Um, we found factories interesting for two reasons. One was the kind of typology of factory making, kind of revisiting it, even though it's a historical typology. And, and the other one was to begin to understand what these kinds of companies produce, the kinds of uh, tools or products that they produce, and um, which kind of spiked this curiosity about, well, how could you use these tools in, in making architecture? So. Um, some of the things that we discovered uh, working early on in the late 90s for companies like Trump was um, their technologies including digital uh, laser cutting, uh, folding, punching of, of metal and uh, even though they hadn't worked that exclusively with architects it seemed so obvious to, to try to appropriate those technologies and use them for producing um, architecture. So one of the things we've done in the last few years is to collect um, these kinds of partners, fabrication partners that are usually specific to uh, a material and the protection of, of its material. Some of these are, are national firms, some of them are international, some of them don't even really uh, relate to architectural culture at all, but to start to um, forge partnerships with some of these groups and then uh, see how they could produce uh, an architectural outcome. Um, another thing we started doing uh, that came out of our teaching at the Architectural Association was to produce these atlases uh, which uh, function like manuals. Uh, we made these very quick, very spontaneously. Um, the books were not meant to feature any one given project, but really to show processes, material processes uh, of, of tooling, of, of materials. Um, as a kind of, and, and to be shown in a kind of, I don't know, agitprop way of uh, sound bites of text um, as a way of producing your own manual. So um, this became a way of, again, archiving our own work. That began to correspond with exhibitions. We started to rethink ex um, architectural uh, exhibitions, uh, not as drawings and models, but as showing you know artifacts right out of the practice, uh, often at a scale of uh, one to one. So exhibition uh, in this 32C presentation or at the AA we did another one was um, really about showing the work as a kind of offcuts that we were producing as a kind of dynamic and evolving archive of, of, of working. So um, at the same time um, we started to look at research projects uh, like most European uh, practices were doing competitions uh, all the time. Uh, starting to embed in the competition uh, research areas. So for an example here, uh, looking at um, uh, space frames as something forward looking, what would the f a future of this be? At the same time, looking back at historical uh, examples from say, I am Pei or Buckminster Fuller. Um, we also, I mean, we work with lots and lots of students in the practice. Uh, we started sending students out to some of these um, industrial sites, factories, you know, almost like missionaries, they would go down there and, and, and research a new machine, understand uh, the economics of a machine, um, the, uh, the speed in production, the complexity of production, uh, the precision in a particular production. And I mean, if you looked at something like this, like say those splints, you know, Charles and Ray Ames made, like in the 50s, um, as a kind of exploration, in this case, uh, without a direct application, but in a very kind of open and experimental way, started to look at this kind of work. Um, this was an exhibition at the Swiss Architectural Museum in Basel, uh, taking the same technique to produce um, an array 
uh, which then ultimately um, became a prototype for a showroom in Sweden where the rotating of the metal tube uh, produce an obvious, I would say, you know, aesthetic effect at the same time has a performative idea of, in terms of transparency seeing in and out of the showrooms as well as um, controlling uh, the sun. So in a way that's a very compressed, um, um, you know, sh illustration of how we might go from a complete experiment with a tool, a material leading to a kind of architectural applications. Others uh, such as um, the, the light structure use a similar technique with um, uh, scripting to produce uh, laser cut tubes that produce a tangential uh, array of pieces, um, but really uh, not as an, in this case, not as an artifact to look at, but really in terms of taking an, uh, an architectural gallery and transforming the space as a kind of uh, installation um, that you experience physically by walking through that. Again, uh, setting up a project that then has a kind of future in finding its use. Um, as I was kind of suggesting with the Space Frame project, um, we, we, we do like to go back and look at um, uh, historical conditions. And in, at, at London, the Superintendent had an amazing conversation with Yona Friedman, and he would say, look, this is what Conrad Baxman does, you know, one thing after another. And I took this idea and flipped it on its head and made it about complete freedom. So, um, so it's really these kinds of debates, uh, 20th century into the 21st century, these kinds of historical debates um, are really interesting for us in terms of working. So um, thinking about that, again, using an archi German architectural competition as a kind of um, vehicle or format for testing some of these ideas. Um, uh, we did a competition for showrooms for Still, who make these, you know, gigantic uh, chainsaws. Uh, Still has a, a factory in, in, in Baden-Württemberg in southern Germany uh, where they have an entire forest which they can cultivate in a sense to produce the material for their own buildings as we suggested. So you could take a chainsaw and start producing these uh, in a way very uh, primitive um, space frames. Uh, this was another conversation with Yona where you don't need a kind of universal joint but you can pin uh, the joints together in a very quickly, very um, simple fashion to produce uh, a, uh, um, a space frame for these exhibition spaces, for this product, uh, using material that's on site, again, as found, bringing it um, to their, their kind of headquarters and then fashioning this into uh, a kind of timber structure with a very simple uh, glass uh, curtain wall to, to, to make um, uh, the uh, enclosure of the space. So, I mean, we like this idea of somehow that the narrative of the project really comes from a, a series of observations on site, what they do, how you can do it, what can you, how can you appropriate those technologies to make something. Um, the Thicket is an ongoing uh, project. This is also, in a sense, a vertical space frame idea. Uh, these are two millimeter stainless steel rods. Uh, we discovered a, a, a coat hanger factory in Munich that could, uh, they said, why not? We can, we can uh, digitally bend these rods uh, to produce a larger array. Uh, this is an art idea that started at um, uh, Sam Tremea, Arnold Brandl, Hoover's our show, How Soon Is Now in Berlin, a couple years ago. Um, but also uh, references of other things from uh, nature. This is a, a film by Nancy Holt, Robert Smithson from 69 called Swamp where Nancy Holt is, is going through um, literally a swamp, a kind of series of reeds and, and photographing them uh, that have different densities of openness or closeness. But the idea of architecture in a way having no beginning, no end, but existing as a kind of uh, a field uh, was a really nice uh, analogy that we like uh, to produce, um, again, maybe a more precise architectural um, version of that idea. Uh, we started teaching ourselves how to produce these things with these frameworks. Uh, welding was too uh, difficult, too expensive, took too long. We just started uh, zip tying the whole uh, project together. Uh, we went to the next level to start testing its capacity, you know, to, to, to hold something like a roof or place on a, on a floor. So in a way for us it became, you know, a kind of vertical domino idea where all vertical structure is almost dematerialized to a kind of, you know, foggy or blurry structure that's structured but also spatializes in a very different way 
uh, could take mechanical systems on. Uh, so we built this as a, as a, as a prototype um, in the op office uh, with the idea that each bundle, uh, bundle was a kind of um, cell for the project and then those cells could add up to produce um, one pavilion, this one uh, unit, and those units, they themselves could uh, multiply into you know, larger um, and more complex arrays. So this was an idea, uh, almost like dominoes, literally dominoes added to each other. You could stack these on top of each other. Um, and uh, I mean, this is a project we tried to sell to Serpentine, and they were like, hmm, well, it's, maybe it's a little too blurry, you know? I mean, they really want form, you know, like some kind of form. So this, this was kind of an interesting uh, debate with a curator, what curators think is architecture. Um, but we very much like the idea of um, defining uh, a space, potentially in a park, um, that has this kind of de dematerialized uh, character at the same time, in a module way, uh, could uh, aggregate and produce bigger and more um, complex um, uh, systems. So um, when we started um, working at Serpentine, which was like the day after Christmas, they called us, Obra said, do you want to do one of these summer houses? We said, yeah, sure, why not? Um, then come here tomorrow and start working on it. So um, the brief was a different one. Um, they typically do a main pavilion. Uh, this was, they re were looking for four um, summer houses that would somehow respond to a, a, a pavilion from 1720 from um, William Kent uh, that was built as a kind of folly uh, in the Kensington Gardens um, for um, Queen Caroline. So, okay, so we, we went and looked at that and then were asked to come up with an idea for um, a pavilion. Um, as we were researching this project, um, we discovered that Kent had done 50 pavilions within a period of 10 years back then, and, and one of them was built on an artificial hill, and it, it rotated. It was mechanically would rotate um, 360 degrees. So there was this idea of seeing this thing up on this little hill, this artificial hill. At the same time, when you occupy this thing, you know, almost like a panopticon, uh, you would have different views of the park um, from this. So, um, we thought that was a tremendously cool thing uh, to discover and, and we were proposing um, you know, the idea of, of, of a pavilion that rotated and I think they, they started looking at us, well you have a budget of 60,000 pounds, you have to do this. And so in a way we needed to translate that idea uh, into a kind of pavilion in the round uh, at this particular site where we began to work. So the site um, perspectively uh, looked at the old pavilion, it looked at where the historical one which disappeared was here, or the, you know, the phantom of the, 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 the famous crystal palace that sat over um, here. So there were a lot of interesting, both existing physical and, and non-existing orientations that the pavilion could begin to take on. So uh, very quickly, uh, again, uh, you know, utilizing some of our previous research, we started looking at, um, in a way, a serpentine structure uh, made out of, uh, out of timber, out of wood, that could start to produce a number of, in a way, extroverted, these, these kind of niches that would project. You could occupy these niches and then look back out to the, to the site. So um, the scheme works that way, that way, and that way with these three uh, U-shaped um, uh, walls, which form the kind of basic structure uh, for, um, for the, the piece. So um, it, it, it has no roof in our version. You could build a roof for it, but it did prove the idea was this sort of series of bands that then um, uh, become structure because of their, uh, if you take a piece of paper and start um, bending it, the tighter you bend it, the more compact it becomes. So we sort of, even in an intuitive way, started learning the structural uh, capacity of this, then work with David Glover, our structural engineer, um, to, to refine uh, this structure. So we went in with a series of, of drawings. Um, this is really, I think, about three weeks ago. Uh, was fabricated by stage one in Yorkshire. Uh, because of the cantilevers of the structures, we decided to produce a steel tube frame, which was laser cut and welded and then to clad it um, with a bendy ply, a plywood to, to stiffen 
the pieces to produce uh, the whole thing. So at the same time, I mean, we're very keen on the idea of it um, having this sculptural capacity, but at the same time, uh, produce spaces, produce these niches which you could um, sit in and, and take it. So there was an idea of occupying it. Um, there is a kind of correspondence between Asaf Khan's project, um, Jonah Friedman over here, uh, Kunle's project here, and our project over here. Um, at the same time, uh, the project could be um, understood um, independently. Let's see, I'm slowing down. So, um, so in a way it does, uh, this is kind of aerial view that Ivan Braun shot a few days ago. Uh, the idea that the thing exists as a structure in the park, um, that, but that it can be occupied, it can be um, uh, by the people can sit here and sort of take it, um, have a certain amount of privacy that each sort of niche um, belongs to its own orientation, its own view, uh, even within a kind of very public, you know, object-like thing in the park at the same time through this kind of uh, material and structural layering could produce these different um, conditions uh, within it. And, and even by thousands of um, Japanese schoolgirls, I think. <laughs> so th these are shots from, I mean, really, literally just a few, few, few hours ago. So, um, but also, like some of our other projects, this idea of the section, um, the structural, the roof, in a way, having a kind of. Um, deep section that conditions the light that goes through it will um, reappear in some of our other projects um, as, as well. Um, as I, in, the, in the diagram before, I was just mentioning some of these projects um, have to do with the different kinds of collaborations. This, this project came out of a collaboration with BMW, Chris Bangle, who was the head of BMW Design a few years ago. We had won a competition for a new design house for him, uh, and, and Chris had this um, sort of crazy idea about um, a car called Gina, uh, which is a fabric that could transform. So he liked very much the idea that a car could be not a fixed object in the sense, you know, that it moves, but the form is static, but the idea that the car uh, itself, the form of the car itself could um, change. So um, his project went on hold, but we kept talking to each other. We ended up going to Harvard and running a studio on uh, lightweight structures, uh, kinetic structures um, that could produce um, affordable housing. So, um, so in a way, some of these projects um, have legs. Um, a slight deviation of that project was for the last Biennale, um, where on, on elements that, that Ram Koolhaas organized, um, the elements of architecture being walls, uh, ceilings, balconies, um, stairs, uh, what he argues is uh, architecture, no matter how progressive it is, still relies on these kinds of um, conventions. So uh, we were in his uh, wall section, uh, beginning with uh, historical walls to um, uh, more contemporary 20th century, uh, modernist walls, glass partitions, and we were asked to contribute a kind of forward-looking idea of a wall. So in order to have him understand the project, uh, we produced this um, kind of knee-jerk model uh, in the office uh, looking at this material. Again, maybe not so much interested in the surface of the material, but the idea that the section between the walls, you know, almost like a Bruce Nauman installation, uh, the walls were very close to each other, and, and we were very keen on the idea of, of transforming uh, the space in between. So. Um, in this photo of Sejima, she's touching uh, the surface of this thing, which is two layers of a nylon that's elastic. When it moves, uh, it produces a kind of um, moiré effect. Um, but as you moved along between um, the two walls, it would, it would sort of press against you very slowly, or again, between the two layers of space. So. Um, so all of a sudden, this is a kind of architectural element, but also for us, one that was you know, maybe latent in terms of uh, a different way of thinking about what a building block might be. So again, we might go back with a project like this, rethink it in the relationship to, say, a housing problem uh, or something else. Um, the, the way it was set up with this, this timber space frame um, is, 
again, more of a kind of demonstration of an idea, but uh, again, a kind of setting up a project that we haven't done yet, but using uh, the exhibition to um, ask that kind of question. Um, on, on the other hand, a project like this um, actually does get sort of deployed uh, as an architectural project. It started in 2012 as an installation uh, at the Marrakesh Biennale um, adjacent to the Katobia Mosque, which is an incredibly beautiful site. Um, we made the project site specific to the five meter uh, colonnade of the ruin uh, next door. And I think we also interested in this idea of you know, how you translate an architectural idea through a very different um, building culture than what we were used to. Um, so we produced um, these models in our practice, I think 1 to 20, and the models are rule geometry, which as you probably know is uh, sim simply lines that are offset, in this case thread, uh, on these frameworks to produce um, you know, hyperbolic uh, surfaces. Um, so uh, how that project translated then was we, we found local timber uh, that we could strip. We had uh, metal, very simple metal joints in the souks. Uh, by local craftsmen uh, who formed these to make the connections. Um, we brought all the materials on site with, you know, donkey power, uh, you know, simple foundations of, of rocks from the desert. Um, worked with Mohammed, who is our um, foreman, who is a really um, skillful weaver. Um, so he could show us how to tie the knots, um, how long it would take uh, with such and such a spacing to produce the project um, in, in two weeks. Um, got sponsoring from Vanessa Branson to do the project and then started to produce it. So this, this sort of gap or this shift between, in a way, the shop-made models we did and the computer digital drawings we made to something um, um, very simple in a way was um, um, quite um, beautiful for us. But also, um, unlike, say, site-specific art for us, uh, this project, again, is a prototype. It's something that could be um, rescaled. It could be something at the scale of a factory. This could also translate into a different material, like uh, steel and timber or steel cable. Um, so we're always looking for a kind of currency in these projects that uh, uh, could have an impact on a, a future project. So where it was important for Carson Chan, the, the curator that um, this could bring a level of modernism and make it public. There are no museums of modern art in, in Marrakesh. Um, as a kind of place for public encounter was important to respond to that, but um, um, we are always looking for ways of, of, of thinking of a project like this in another kind of, uh, of context. So, um, so in a way for this project, um, which this happened kind of quickly after at a completely different location, different scale, was this fellow's pavilion for the American Academy. In Berlin, uh, the American Academy is on the Vadse. It's in an old uh, 19th century villa. Uh, it's completely packed. They need more spaces for the scholars to work. So we wanted to make a, a study pavilion in the garden um, that unlike some of the other projects we've done, you know, where you have a, a roof covering a very open space, this is a very cellular uh, space for, for uh, seven scholars. Um, so, so that this register below door height, uh, again, we use in, the, in a very American way, you know, just use uh, American, you know, like suburban sliding doors that open out to a porch uh, to have a very lightweight steel, translating into steel roof that would float uh, over those spaces. So even though the rooms are divided from each other, you would have this kind of, you know, universal reading of the roof holding the thing together. Uh, of course, we love the, 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 the Mies uh, pavilions like Farnsworth or Barcelona, all, you know, also with a nice little Colby statue. Um, sitting in the garden was kind of a nice relationship too. Uh, and then along this wall. So um, this is the Vance. These are these you know, beautiful villas from the 19th century. Uh, the American Academy inherited this villa here and we were able to take on a site uh, over, over here. So this is the, the pavilion in the park. Again, really very much a kind of pristine uh, white pavilion on, the, on this lawn, and then organized with the you know, almost diagrammatic, super simple plan, the seven study uh, places that then can open up uh, in a way socially, I suppose, to this, this porch that one can sit on. So one can either retreat into these spaces and work in a very private way um, or 
you know, interact or meet other people uh, on, on the porch space uh, around it. So, um, again, the, 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 the rule geometry in this case uh, translated from the, the yarn to the steel construction, uh, you know, with, you know, German detailing, so everything sort of thermally uh, isolated and then uh, combined uh, with uh, oak uh, floors. So, uh, this is the two uh, scholars moving in, which is Beatrice and Mark. <laughs> It was kind of intimidating, but um, but they, they loved it. I mean, they, they found themselves at home, so they were able to uh, work uh, in a concentrated way in, in this uh, new space. So um, that that was that was kind of a, a fun thing about this particular project. Um, like a lot of the projects we do in in in, in Europe, Northern Europe, particularly, these uh, is is a lot of uh, prefabrication. Of the steel work so that the piece can be built um, on site um, very uh, quickly and then uh, produces a fact at night uh, so the building uh, acts almost like a lantern uh, on the lawn with uh, the walls uplighting uh, the roof and the ceiling and then I, I think we actually sort of fake this you know she got these books <laughs> <laughs> sitting on the porch but this is the idea of the space opening up to uh, in a way a more uh, public uh, way of working. Um, Johan described in the beginning this, this idea of, of liminal facade and or what we call liminal facade. Somehow we started working in Berlin and all of a sudden you know facades in a way you know became a, a site uh, themselves a kind of architectural site with, within a larger uh, building site and because it's the kind of image of the project um, in terms of engineering, uh, there's so much, um, um, you know, performative engineering, sustainable engineering happening in the facade, um, and, and particularly for developer-driven projects in Berlin where you're, they're just trying to develop, uh, you know, rentable floor area. This, the, the, somehow the facade is the meter between the private client and, and the public city, um, but as a kind of work area in its own right. So, and as, as Tony was saying, this idea of a, um, a kind of mediator between a, a typically a very private interior and a, a very public exterior. So some of the earlier thinking about this was, say, the Gewandhaus in Dresden, which was a, um, a, a kind of gallery, a cafe building uh, on a site uh, we took all of the historical buildings uh, that were proposed for that site but never built and then kind of morphed them uh, into a, a single building. Uh, we went to Dresden, Dresden and started, as, as you know, this famous uh, Baroque city, uh, mapping uh, some of the surfaces that uh, the, the adjacent Baroque buildings had and then used that as a... Um, idea for a stacked concrete or stone facade that could be um, either extremely familiar as a kind of historical form um, or um, unfamiliar through this kind of deviation to the actual building of what you would think of as a, a typical sandstone uh, wall. So um, if that was a, a starting point, something like Tour Total, uh, which Johan also referenced uh, near the Hauptbahnhof train station in Berlin, uh, was um, an idea of, of taking, in a way, a kind of uh, familiar uh, Berlin typology, the so-called raster facade, or what you would call like a Chicago frame facade, uh, as a load-bearing facade, uh, look at how that could uh, be familiar that way, but um, again, through some digital means, formally transform it through a kind of um, uh, manipulation of the geometry. So. Uh, again, this was the first building in this whole area north of the train station, so the developers were quite interested in it, but at the same time, uh, the city was uh, getting a lot of pressure to improve the quality of architecture on site and to kind of risk, you know, raise the, the bar on, on what was going on there. So, um, so we, we were able to kind of move between, you know, the, the developer and the, and the city in terms of producing a building. So. Um, at this time, we were very keen on uh, researching precast concrete as a facade idea. Uh, we found a company in Schlockstadt, close, actually very close to here, uh, who produced these for us and asked, you know, if we could produce a load-bearing uh, facade as a perimeter condition. So, 
you know, unlike, you know, like, low, you know, lower Manhattan, where you're still producing, you know, glass skins, uh, we're still very much interested in the idea of a, of a facade that has a kind of depth, which is structural, but is also um, spatial uh, for this geometry. So uh, we designed a T uh, element with Dressler, the producers, uh, that kind of knit together to produce this facade. Uh, in another iteration, we'll be able to use this as a, as a complete exoskeleton without an inner side, and then a kind of origami geometry on the pieces. So, um, so you know, in a way, revisiting the precast concrete project, um, we discovered that um, they don't really care. We knew how to produce complex formwork through our digital fabrication. Um, capabilities and they were happy to make you know 100 200 pieces that are completely unique so you know this is kind of an aha moment where all of a sudden um, you can economically produce facades that could be very uh, extremely complex um, which I would say you know 20 30 years ago would have been almost impossible and extremely precise and then with custom uh, finishes so you know, this, this is a technique that we hadn't u really used before, something we could in introduce to ourselves to produce, again, a facade that, you know, fits within that kind of Berlin idea of, of a raster facade at the same time, um, having this other dynamic um, at work in the facade, um, you know, emphasizing the diagonal, uh, de-emphasizing the single floors, the vert verticality, um, through that kind of, um, uh, facade uh, depth. So, and again, I, I mean, maybe one of the other things, you know, that we're doing, I mean, we're, we're not usually doing, you know, Guggenheim museums. So for us, these are kind of factories and office buildings are in a way like everyday building typologies. So I think there is an interest in, in finding out what you can um, um, do within those kinds of, of parameters are, which are quite different, you know, ceramic tiles for the interior. Um, what we can do that and at the same time um, beginning to work urbanistically uh, with the first building, the second building in a metal curtain wall producing um, a kind of slip space that's pedestrian between these um, buildings. So, um, so all of a sudden we found ourselves working in sites that are, are, are quite urban um, in comparison to the kind of periphery projects we had worked on for so many years uh, that included factories uh, things like that, and then to produce a kind of surface effect to um, identify uh, not only the particular building, but the means of constructing and, and the sort of economics of constructing these different kinds of, of, of buildings. Um, you had also mentioned the, the um, I'm kind of going backwards in time now, but um, uh, the Korean building uh, in terms of, of an idea of liminal or liminality was <laughs> I mean, really uh, an incredibly important project for us when we, we, we did a project in Seoul, Korea, which of course was um, a, a place and a context that was very foreign to us. Uh, and also how you work there, how you could build would be very different than say Berlin. Um, as students at Harvard, we were always fascinated by, you know, even the rhetoric of a building like Harry Cobb's Hancock building where, um, you know, the, this, this sort of um, narrative of, you know, integrating uh, history and context through uh, you know, this enigmatic, reflective facade. Uh, one of the things we were fascinated by that was this, um, this sort of aberrations. You know, you could, at that time, you know, if you remember the glass panes were like popping off on the sidewalk, um, but this sort of distortion that the, that the panes were never perfectly flat. So um, right away we thought um, if you just tweaked it a little bit more in, in a very flat depth, 20, 30 centimeters, uh, you could produce a facade that would begin to uh, perform like a kaleidoscope. So um, this is our, our studios, our office in the background, these brick um, factory buildings. And uh, we started producing mock-ups in the courtyard at, at a large scale, one to two, one to three. Um, at the same time, we had guys inside like drawing patterns, like understanding the limits of glass, the complexity of geometry um, to produce uh, this building. So with fairly limited means, we had one type a three-dimensional type, you could flip it upside down, it becomes a different type. We had uh, two-dimensional or, or flat glass panels that were more economical. Um, but in terms of complexity, we could produce a very complex, uh, again, kaleidoscopic facade using um, a window frame uh, in a very flat section, 
uh, that you know we taught ourselves in the in the you know with CNC uh, how to cut that. So um, and this idea of collaborations, Jerry from Arups in Hong Kong would come in with Allotech, um, the guys uh, in Korea in Seoul. Uh, I started producing really like at the time really you know like unique um, facade sections for producing uh, this building, which again is kind of a, a core and section. Uh, building. In order to do that, you know, we started producing mock-ups and, you know, blasting them with uh, water and, and air to see if they would perform. They did, uh, which meant we could go into production. So, um, in a highly, you know, very precise building culture of, you know, exactly when they'll be done, how much it will cost, uh, and putting this building to, together. So, I mean, so all of a sudden, this is really the time, 2006, you know, 10 years ago, we were really doing these customized buildings uh, in a completely, you know, like parachuting into a completely foreign building culture um, for, for us to produce um, a building again that, you know, it's not really a fetish about um, detail or anything, even though it is very precisely built, but um, the idea of the facade as a kind of visual um, um, condition that would, um, you know, be affected by the weather, by people walking by, the crazy window washers, um, the LED advertising across the street. It would transform, you know, from day to night. It could be opaque, it could be reflective, um, and it could be transparent. So, um, again, as a kind of uh, one-off project, again, you know, doing the math, understanding the geometrical progressions of the projects, but then you know, at the same time, you know, through the mock-ups in our courtyard, really having a pretty good understanding of the physical effects, the experimental, visual, optical effects of this thing, um, and, and then going into production. Oh, Chanel ripped it off. Um, but they, you know, they, they countersued us, so we kind of dropped it. And all we, you know, all we wanted was the shoes. And so we had kind of fun with that. But, you know, I, I think there's still a kind of ambition in these projects, you know, the, the, the cladding in the lobby. Uh, we did a, a suspended um, um, stair with Schleich uh, here. So I think there is, even in these kind of core shell buildings, there's a kind of consistency through at the offset core and show plans. Um, but there is a kind of um, totality, even though the focus in these cases is, is facade. Um, Ultra Structural is a series of projects that um, are cellular structures. So um, we kind of grouped a number of projects that started to look at things like this natural phenomenon, like hierarchical um, cell structures. These are things I'm sure you also look at as students here. Um, uh, for a project um, in an industrial context. So this is the, the Trump headquarters. Uh, it's almost like an endless city along the Autobahn, the historical city back here. Uh, the factories, as I was saying, these are earlier factories that we do, which are constantly being added to. Uh, it's kind of like nonstop city. You, you build one phase, you build the next, the next, the next. Uh, other, these two buildings were not. Those buildings are uh, in, in the German sort of solitary buildings uh, that we produced as, as, in a way, social centers. Uh, it's a cantina, like a mensa, and the German Mittelstand is usually, you know, a very spießig uh, restaurant in a basement. Um, and there was an ambition to elevate this to uh, an event space. So the geometry has to do with negotiating between existing buildings on site. Um, and we began, uh, like many of these projects, working with students, uh, testing different ideas. So. Uh, we knew that we wanted this sort of leaf-like canopy roof. Uh, we tested it as a wood construction. We tested it as a concrete construction. We tested it as steel. Um, we ended up doing workshops um, with uh, Werner Sobeck uh, in Stuttgart. Uh, we liked very much the idea of uh, the, the roof covering a kind of excavation, almost like an amphitheater, which you see here. Uh, the whole campus is connected at a, a lower tunnel level. Uh, so we really wanted to, in a way, make it disappear as an object, kind of suppress that, and emphasize the sectional space that this, this um, roof would um, cover. And um, so the partner here was Hospital Almond. This is a, a wood fabricating a, a company in the Black Forest. Uh, they built a prototype for us so we could test the joints, the economics of it. It was, 
uh, very accurate, so we simply uh, built it right into the project, uh, translated our drawings uh, into theirs, uh, went into these gigantic um, production runs to produce it, you know, brought everything on the site uh, so we could very quickly um, put this roof up with these little helper columns uh, where essentially every joint uh, could be unique uh, as, as needed to the structural loading uh, to produce this. So, whereas the roof is very specific in its geometries, the idea of the plan was to make it very open, very flexible, very changeable, and to use these column groups um, uh, as few as possible to keep that openness. So we ended up combining steel for the primary structure to get these spans and then the glue laminated timber as an infill to produce that. So that um, the geometry of the roof, which again is very, you know, a lot, of, lot going on, uh, some of these cells could be acoustical, some of them could be uh, skylights, some of them could be uh, acoustical lighting. Uh, to produce this effect. So where you have this highly super articulated uh, roof in a way this kind of open sea of um, this openness of the plan could uh, work as a cafeteria, could work as uh, for, for music, could uh, work for lectures or parties uh, and then by um, sinking uh, the whole space, uh, four meters under grade, uh, we gained uh, this mezzanine which is essentially at grade and had all the kind of kitchens and technical stuff um, back behind it. So the possibility that, um, and if you look at somewhere earlier, we're also this interesting landscape where you have this kind of articulated ground moving through this. You know, you have different scales of space. So the mezzanine is quite low and in and, and the lower level, it's, uh, you have this very high space or the roof could cantilever over and again produce a kind of uh, porch uh, like space, but the emphasis was really about the sectional space of the of, of this, and, and less so uh, about it being um, an object in the landscape, and then allowing this building in a way to be a kind of point of of, of meeting for these very diverse uh, types of you know high tech workers uh, on a on an industrial campus uh, like this. Um, at the same time, we did this project for um, also with Werner. Um, a gatehouse uh, for a new entrance to the campus uh, where the idea at this time was uh, to use their technology, I mean, very directly in producing uh, this building. So um, we were aware of uh, a history of architects such as uh, uh, Jean Prouvé, and one of the questions was, you know, if Jean Prouvé was, Prouvé was still operating, um, how would he use technology today? So we had discovered that uh, Trump was making uh, these decks, could be for a tabletop, could be for a ship, uh, which were laser cut and welded. And then the question was, could we translate that into uh, you know, a very dynamic, you know, mega cantilever uh, roof? So um, you know, we inherited these uh, loading diagrams from Banner's office and then began to map those um, into uh, the roof. So in a way, the model, which is 1 to 50, was actually built uh, almost identically to uh, the, the 1 to 1 model. So these are the pieces, uh, again, built a mock-up to understand the joints, became much more complex, welded joints, mechanical roofs, uh, joints, and then dropping this um, you know, giant roof, almost like a diving board, onto these uh, four steel columns, you know, two in tension, uh, and two in compression, and then uh, mapped on the on the lower uh, sort of girt um, or you know webbing here, mapped the kind of loading information uh, back onto that, and then uh, for this project, uh, produce a double uh, curtain wall uh, for it um, using um, you know artists in a way sort of cra craftsmen to produce a plexiglass tube. Uh, wall, which we then tipped up, which is entirely made of glass, either float glass or a laminated acrylic glass. But um, all of a sudden, we were producing projects, uh, buildings where we were really designing all of the systems within it, and you know, resolving the details. We detailed a, a gasket here so that even if the roof had like three meters of snow on it, it, it wouldn't deflect enough to to crush this, you know, very delicate. Um, facade that we produced uh, for the project. Um, 
So, some one year old, one -year -old beers. Um, so this, this is a pro an idea that we took down the street, so to speak. We, we had finished those projects and we were asked for, um, by Daimler to, um, to look at a new museum dedicated to the future between the Necker River and the Necker Park. This is Ben's building over here, of course, um, with its um, landscape. Uh, we also wanted to continue the idea of landscape to produce uh, a workshop here and parking over here. Um, but in a way, in a way, a more disciplined version of the Serpentine project was uh, to produce a loop structure. We produced forms that were CNC cut, uh, you know, our alto style uh, looped veneer around these to produce um, a kind of structural array on a nine meter by nine meter grid. Um, the tubes would, uh, the coils would be translated in steel construction. Um, with Roman Bollinger, uh, the idea was to fill these with, with water. Uh, so this would be the heating and cooling for the system. So again, a kind of deep section that would condition the daylight into the space that could also have a kind of spanning capacity. Uh, we tested this idea as, a, as an installation, the BDA uh, gallery uh, in Berlin, and then uh, came back to look at an oval-shaped roof, 140 meters wide, that produced these kind of slip spaces between um, the landscape elements. Uh, and then a complex roof of both redundant structure uh, and then, you know, more idiosyncratic spaces underneath uh, the kind of museum spaces that could um, infill it. So in a way, you know, these are, these are kind of interrelated research projects that we were thinking about where um, the roof with a kind of structural capacity and a kind of structural um, depth would, would have a kind of uh, flexibility uh, for these for these kinds of projects. So again, as a kind of work in progress, uh, those illustrate those kind of ideas. Um, makeover is really um, an, uh, another chapter in the book where uh, we find ourselves also not simply building new buildings, and I think this was certainly a theme of the, the Venice Biennale, which is going right now, but um, how do you um, react to existing buildings structures. So in this case, this was a competition for the, a facade competition uh, for the Charité uh, Hospital in Berlin, in former East Berlin. So the idea was how could you transform this, I mean literally sort of a klotz or this block in the middle of the city through a facade that would be performant in the sense that making, the, giving the patients more um, privacy, uh, more quiet, at the same time improving the, the energy use uh, for the building, so that um, in this sense, this, this sort of double glass facade would um, make the building in a way disappear or make it much, much more ephemeral on the skyline at the same time doing all these things uh, that the client was asking. Um, I guess because we've been doing this for a while, um, we actually make over something that we find ourselves thinking about with our own buildings. This was the, the Potsdam Biosphere, which was done you know, some years ago as a kind of uh, constructed uh, landscape. If you remember this project, uh, this was a former military site uh, where the Soviets built these uh, berms uh, to protect their barracks. So uh, for us, in a kind of like, almost like land art, uh, it was a really interesting idea to, to make a building out of these forms. So, uh, this was for the German Garden Show, and then it, it later became a kind of event space, so-called biosphere. So uh, this uh, is a very dynamic kind of landscape, and then we put a very simple, you know, almost industrial uh, roof over it. Um, the, the, the building has kind of outlived its purpose. Um, economically, they need a new model for it. So we've been asked to come in and look at putting um, a school um, a kind of middle school in this space, so in a sense, almost like, a, I guess, like a ship in the ball was to take this uh, existing large space and begin to look at um, uh, classrooms that could uh, occupy that space, which is interesting because, in a way, you can have two climates. These can have one climate and then a quasi, either hot or cold uh, space around it, underneath these spaces, on top of it, into the roof, that then, 
uh, the children would have a direct access to this, this large park uh, next to it. So um, this strange sort of phenomenon of revisiting older projects and then uh, hoping that those projects have a kind of enough um, you know, flexibility or potential, latent potential within them themselves to transform uh, these things both spatially as well as, as, as programmatically. Um, the last section, site-specific, is a number of projects, um, but this was this idea of, of, of an architecture uh, that does um, relate to the conditions as we do, as we find them. How are we doing for time? Are we okay? Fine. Um, Berlin housing is something uh, we've been looking at the practice. Um, it also relates to a studio that uh, Arnold Brandelhuber and I taught last spring for Harvard GSD in Berlin, but it started with this idea of 30,000 residential units over the next five years. Uh, and this is completely before the, the refugee uh, crisis of the last uh, 12 months. So uh, with the Harvard students, we started to research existing models in Berlin. And I mean, some of these are really fascinating. You know, the Schlangenbader housing uh, in West Berlin, the former West Berlin, 1981. Uh, also an idea of a kind of endless city uh, could use the air rights over the Autobahn to produce um, uh, terraced housing. We discovered this amazing uh, model of, you know, parking, uh, the Autobahn kind of ripping through the building, this pyramid of, of housing, terrace circulation, uh, and looked at these kinds of models for ways of, of generating new ideas um, for housing. So, I mean, as you all know, um, and particularly in Berlin, this is um, what happened um, in the last 12 months in terms of this kind of, particularly in the, those, those, if you remember in those, those first months, how um, ur this urgency of really producing housing, uh, temporary housing in Berlin, and uh, a, th this initiative which was already there became a kind of um, hyper initiative. So one of the first things we did were looking at um, just used, you know, mega structures, you know, like the ICC colony or what we call the ICC, the, the Congress Center um, in West Berlin that, that is sort of underused or disused um, as an idea for, for generating um, housing inside of a space like this that has its own kind of, you know, and Berlin is a place that really is about kind of monumental um, interiors where um, we could take that interior to produce um, uh, lightweight prefabricated housing that could address its own um, climatized garden. Uh, we could rethink the existing roof as something that could open up and weather or, or close down. So all of a sudden, in a way, it was like going back, I don't know, maybe to the 60s and thinking about projects that in a way are somewhere be between being <laughs> utopian and, and, and being uh, realistic. So with Arno and, and Nicholas Fritz Neumar, um, we ran a studio just as this um, crisis was beginning to um, unfold. And with Arnold, the idea of legislating architecture really was how do you um, create a density for housing in a city and what are those techniques that you use and how do you use those techniques in relationship to um, legislation. So we ran a seminar. Uh, with this image, famous image of Hugh Ferris's uh, New York zoning uh, laws from the 20s. How could you use or, in a sense, work with and around those uh, legislation uh, to produce new forms? So, for example, Julian's project, um, and these are the students' projects, uh, looked at the Tempelhof um, um, airport, uh, discovered that this site, that the, 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 the main part of the airport will be will be used for a park, but that this site could be utilized. So looking at the existing structure uh, and the kind of sight lines found an allowance to produce a, a mat scheme. So simply by tipping uh, the housing at different um, rakes, different steepnesses uh, can produce a kind of mat scheme or terrace housing over here. And then to create a kind of public space underneath it could, could be given over to um, gardens or um, uh, theaters, uh, things like that, and at the same time benefit from uh, a direct access to the park and was able to generate some um, uh, 10,000 uh, 10, units for that. And, and a lot of these projects, you know, they work at different scales. 
Um, Chris's project was about uh, mat schemes that infilled uh, along the Karl Marx Allee between the Plattenbau um, that could um, take the idea of the park, which was you know nominally used, put the park on the roof um, and create these kinds of uh, you know matrixes, almost a kind of super studio uh, matrix of housing uh, that could be two-story, could have gardens cut through there. So. Um, so they were looking at three or four different sites, were able to come up with different typologies uh, for producing these things um, and, and, and create uh, density and, again, affordable housing for the city. Something, you know, again, paralleling back to our own practice, something we've been paralleling, uh, in this case, an idea for a bauluka, these, these holes in the cities where you could structurally produce a kind of catenary, uh, structure that would hang from one party wall to the next, which means you could produce housing in this space, the space um, in between, or the interstitial space uh, could be given over to uh, workspaces, so you could have a kind of work live, work live, work live uh, section um, going through that to um, uh, high rises. Again, uh, high rises has been a another typology. Uh, this was uh, Koloff's uh, 1993 master plan for Alexander Platz. Uh, this is the sort of, you know, Jetzt site. Uh, the reality of that site now is that so many buildings have been um, restored. Um, it's much, much more fragmented and will never really be able to take on that kind of homogeny. So uh, there was a competition for a residential tower uh, for housing. Uh, we produced a, a tower idea of, of, of rotating units from very, very small, very economical units to uh, larger um, uh, units within this, within a kind of deep plate um, satu. So uh, again, this idea of different scales was really about, um, it could be a high rise, it could be an infill, it could be adding on top of an existing building, but um, there were very uh, many different ideas of producing this. I, th I think this is the last project um, but this is the tower um, that we're doing for, for Estrell. Uh, it will be a hotel. It's a hotel that can also be uh, converted into housing if needed uh, as a kind of construction ensemble of, of different types of building across from the existing uh, hotel from the 80s. So um, it's a gateway condition between uh, the new airport whenever it's finished and the 19th century fabric of, of Neukölln and Kreuzberg uh, making a gateway between the existing building and the new. So um, it was interesting because, um, you know, again, you can see where the periphery is fairly fragmented. The historical um, figure ground is, is much dense. Um, it was completely different than Alexanderplatz in the sense that we could actually uh, produce a kind of uh, family of geometrical forms to produce this as a kind of ensemble. So we needed, uh, we used the tangram idea of, of triangulated forms which related to the existing building. Uh, they could be extruded at different heights. They could also take on different kinds of programmatic uh, uses to produce this ensemble. So we're in the middle of working on this uh, with a tower which will be the highest building in Berlin. Uh, an office building, parking structure, uh, atrium, and a kind of uh, congress hall uh, next to it. So, uh, so within this building, which for us is almost at the scale of a, a master plan, um, you know, we, we can employ many ideas in terms of facade making, um, ideas about structural making, large span, from horizontal structures to very vertical um, structures. So whereas the idea of a one-off high rise in Berlin, I think somehow is really difficult, the idea of it as a kind of ensemble that mediates between, uh, say, the historical city and the fragmented historical periphery of the city um, made sense for us. Um, I guess it wasn't the last project, but um, the smart, ma I gotta show this. The smart materials house, we've been working on this for five years, and it started as um, a project at the EBA, the International Building Exhibition in, in Hamburg, and, and the premise was smart materials. So um, we didn't like the idea of making a building where you just simply tack a lot of shiny things on it and that makes it smart, but actually look at something in a way much, much more archaic. So 
um, we went to um, our engineers, Translar, Mike Schleich, who is working with Infolight Concrete. Uh, it's a concrete that's, uh, its aggregate is recycled glass or clay. If you put it in a bathtub, it'll float. And then in a sort of strange way, combining it with um, timber floors. So um, we came up with this sort of multitasking component, which is, uh, it has a formal shape that's kind of sculptural, but also meant that it could be freestanding. If you put it on the ground, it wouldn't fall over without needing uh, scaffolding. Uh, you could put all the heating and cooling in it. It could do this kind of solar absorption stuff um, as a kind of building block that for us had um, a domestic scale for, for housing. And you could combine it with very simple wood uh, windows. So, um, so in diagramming this, we realized that because everything's sort of self-insulated, in, uh, uh, each floor plate could be slightly different. They could stack over each other like a, like a house of cards and, um, and could be built um, very quickly on site. So uh, there was the idea of these, these pieces, really simple, just the concrete pieces, the precast concrete pieces, the timber floors uh, and the windows to make uh, these, you know, almost like a broke um, um, plan, which can be broken up into kind of a nine square or can be completely uh, open. Uh, like a loft. So, um, so all of a sudden, you know, if you thought about modernism being about steel and glass and about lightness, all of a sudden uh, we could find a material that's in a sense modern, but um, using this idea of thickness, a kind of uh, material thickness as a poche, which is both performative at the same time, would condition the spaces of these apartments and, and, and even how uh, the light uh, would come in them. So. Uh, again, and that had a kind of inherent flexibility. You could break them up into smaller rooms or you could leave it, as we show in this down view, in, in a kind of open uh, configuration. Um, and like much of this stuff, um, you know, these guys um, built models, really large scale models in pink foam because the pink foam is more or less the same material uh, as the concrete. And then uh, to build these large scale models to see how they work structurally, laterally, um, but also spatially, this idea of, of, of a kind of undulating facade that produces outdoor spaces, balconies, uh, as well as this kind of concave, uh, convex uh, space making uh, on the interior. So, um, and this is probably the most you know, purest exercise of forcing ourselves literally to start with the material and then work through the process of, of making the material produce uh, a kind of architectural outcome. Um, through these exercises, um, we won prize money from um, Wholesome, these Swiss concrete guys, um, who then started producing um, uh, prototypes for us, one-to-one, -one, which we could test. We could try different finishes on it, um, see how they would work, test the capacity. Uh, and then, boom, again, the, 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 this housing crisis um, in Berlin uh, allowed us you know, a chance to um, to rethink this project. The project was you know, not gonna happen in Hamburg. I love that picture. Um, but in Berlin, it, it started to make sense in a, in, a, in a different sort of typology. So the typology that we started looking at was the, the point tower for housing along three or four low rows behind the Karl Marx Allee in the former East Berlin. So. Um, Again, like we like to do, we went back and looked at a history. The, the Plattenbau, or these plate buildings, were built um, uh, in a kind of mass production, Khrushchev looking at a model. And these things were built, as you know, all over uh, Eastern Europe. Um, so we discovered a, a kind of pilot project, a kind of prototype that would fit within a fairly low density of, of housing around the Karl Marx Allee. Here's the Alexanderplatz over here, that, which I just showed. And we had discovered many, many sites where you could drop in a tower of say eight or 12 stories, you know, without uh, disrupting the, the, the neighbor's, you know, light or air or view. So, uh, so in the meantime, the, the city has asked us uh, along the lines of regular Lucia's urban planning initiative to, to develop uh, one of these towers. So uh, structurally it's different. Uh, the, the steel is in line so that um, the concrete in a way stiffens the steel embedded in it. It also insulates it, it fireproofs the steel. Um, so we had to recalibrate in a way the, the structural idea of the project um, to produce a new idea for, for housing. So 
That's the, the last slide. But, but anyway, just wanted to say, kind of, again, this is a little sort of encapsulation of how we've been working for the last five or ten years. But to show examples, I know it's a lot of different examples, but again, the office kind of works like this. There's a lot of things happening at the same time. There's a lot of overlap of ideas. And again, I wanted to show the relationship between the more research end of the practice and, and, the, and the building projects that we're actually doing. Thanks again. It's great to be back in Frankfurt. Questions, advice, um, I, I'm completely open. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I wasn't able to go through the studios, you know, which I usually am able to do, so I'm always curious what you guys are up to, too. But um, yeah, let me know what you're thinking. The question is of the geometry and the... Uh... Uh, my question was, uh, there was a series of projects which was based on two geometry. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, was it because of the easiness of rationalizing the project or was it because of the initial geometry which it brings on the table? Um, I, I don't think, I mean, those, I think those infrastructural, I think we call those projects, those, those kind of cellular projects, I mean, mm -hmm. They're not particularly easy, but um, I think um, it was a time, again, like again, about 10 years ago where we, sh we could do that. We could start using more um, complex geometry and in relationship to more complex structural things. I mean, if you went five years back, it would have been, also would not have been possible, at least for us. Um, so it coincided in a way historically with Again, these kind of fabrication capabilities, the engineers, the engineering was, was able to do that. So I think, um, you know I mean? I, I think if in our practice, if we find a vacuum that we could fill, we will. You know, if, if there's a series of opportunities that are out there, then um, we'll pursue them. So, you know, there's always a series of, of, of things that were not possible to do and things that were possible to do. So that whole kind of geometric, area kind of opened up um, that is also supported by a lot of our fabrication research and it was simple it was possible to do that you know within a series of three or four projects at that time it's hard to do them every day though i'm fascinated by this uh, i've always admired the work but um, also it's been very in a very nice way, in terms of you know, seeing a housing project like this, but also seeing the, the corporate of, office um, buildings and having the, the character and the, and the appearance in, in the city that is just extremely refreshing. Generally, I'm wondering though, so throughout the next year, we set up out a certain relationship between um, um, research and then the practice, and there are fascinating ways to see how you find opportunities in the practice to actually use um, some of the research. But I'm wondering how, how important is then, two questions sort of, is there at any one point a, a, um, a very conscious effort to formulate uh, shorter or longer term research agendas, or is it more that you take research opportunities when they come? That's one thing. And then the other thing is sort of sound in hand. How important are the academic studios that you teach to that research and experimental work? Well, the first question, I, I think it would be the second way of working, which is more, um, um, did you, you heard the question, right? Um, the, how we work, the, the research component, um, and I would say it's much more as opportunities uh, present themselves. I don't, the idea of a kind of methodical research group of, you know, exactly 10 people doing something every day um, is a difficult luxury <laughs> to accommodate. So um, exhibitions, 
um, are good formats. Um, but every once in a while, we'll just drive a research thing that, that, in a sense, has no sponsoring, and we'll do it. But it's it's a much more I would call a dynamic process than, you know, like the R and D department at IBM or something. You know, I mean, we're um, it's a much more fluid process. So depending on um, what we're trying to do, but um, and sometimes it's the competitions where you just want more out of these things than trying to hit all the right notes and win, you know, especially these German competitions which are quite, could be quite formulaic, so you want something out of it that might be simply winning a competition, so um, so it, it operates at different scales and, and very different um, sort of levels of um, investigation, I mean it's always kind of in the background, but um, but but I would it's not as consistent maybe as as one would think in a, a kind of a research format. Then academically, I think I think the way we've taught has changed. From in the beginning, we were teaching more of the time, and the practice the practice was just getting started, was just emerging. So I, I I would say that academically, I don't know that 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 kind of real politic of what's happening in the office and those constraints and opportunities in a way the more the closer we can get for us you know the closer we can get that to the studio the more vital the studios become and I think this was a conversation with Arno the last one and those the kind of specificities of legislations or the politics of those things um, he the conversation with Arno I mean he's very keen on the idea that those factors really driving an architectural outcome so that you're kind of, you know, so it would be completely different than say we were working at the AA or in DRL, you know, back in the, the 90s or something that, um, that those conditions which are real um, uh, drive the work in the studio so, um, and, or what we're trying to do in the practice. So, you know what I mean? Like painters paint, painting, paint, paint, art students paint, make art, you know, and there's always this funny gap. So um, we like to go to the studio. We also like students in the practice. So, you know, they, they meet with the engineers, they meet with consultants. So all those kind of triggers in a way, I, I guess we find, you know, barriers or opportunities, whatever you can call them, make the academic work really interesting, I think. Um, and, and we start documenting academic work that way. So when we go into a studio, um, we don't go in as experts teaching something. We go in with three or four questions. And so in the way this, the, the, the results are a thesis in response to question, whether it's about a new materiality or, or generating density in a city that's desperate for affordable housing. I, those, those factors, I think, are so so interesting. I mean, we still like to operate it as, as architects with, um, you know, technical and, and tectonic virtuosity and materials and space making. All the kind of, again, what makes architecture architecture and not art. But um, these 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 questions out there, I, we really try to pull the academic studio closer to the practice. And I think practice is so interesting now, right? There's something in the in the project. This one, the, um, well, I suppose, also what you've done uh, with, with your uh, material experiments that are related to uh, part of the Trump uh, tooling. Yeah, yeah, started there. Yeah, that seems to me to be you know, I mean, it's real in the sense that you know, these are um, real material substances, and you are manipulating those and you're discovering. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, it has very little to do with the, uh, what do you call it, real politics. Real politics, yeah. Real politics yeah. practice. So, I hear you, but there seems to me to be at least a twofold sort of um, aspect of the work. The, the reality of the practice and the reality of the... Yeah, the, the material, you know, where the material experiments also are, they begin to approach a more sort of formal yeah. exploration of opportunities. Yeah. Well, I, I think in the early steps, you 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 know you need you want this freedom at, at the early steps. You want the freedom, uh, a certain amount of autonomy, and you want 
to be able to be experimental. So I think, especially when you work with students, that they have that kind of, and then there's a kind of filtering of that material into something like this. So the idea that we could take some of those formal conceits and still be able to deploy them and convince a, you know, a, a, a city um, planning authority that this is a good idea for, I mean, that's quite interesting <laughs> if you can make that bridge, right? So, but, but you need, I think research needs a certain amount of autonomy. It can't be, because there's all these other things that are just going to crush you, right? You know, the deadlines and costs and um, so, but I think it's somehow getting those two points to, to, to meet each other is where things become really interesting, I think. So can you use those capabilities at the same time, produce what has historically been the most banal, reductive, repetitive, architectural typology on the planet, right? Low income housing. Um, so that's, I mean, I guess that's the kind of agility both um, you know, intellectually as well as physically in the practice that we, that we strive for. I mean, we're not always successful. I mean, that's the thing about research too. You, have to, you fail also, things go wrong, you know? So um, it's about risk, right? And school is, needs to be about risk taking too, right? So, um, but those are the ambitions, you know, to get those things to meet somewhere. <laughs> Don't you think? Um, so I, I don't know, yeah, so I, I became more, and I don't, it's not that I want to be the pragmatic guy, but when we teach studios, I think, and, and Arnold, for sure not, you know, but you, he, you're looking for something, but... Um, I heard, I heard, um, Hani Rashid, in conversation with a few other people, um, it was not too long ago, at the United Center for Architecture, and it was in relationship to um, it was one of the events in Great Britain's uh, archaeology of the digital. So it was uh, Rashid being there um, with the project for the New York Stock, Stock Exchange. But it was a little bit sad hearing a very sort of. Um, uh, he sort of like, he, by no means did he disown the work, but it was sort of like something that he clearly said, we put that behind us right now. Be concerned with something that when you say the ultimate, I sort of you know I begin to sort of hear the echo of something that becomes um, very pragmatic, very um, client oriented, which yeah. by all means I you know I yeah. appreciate it and understand the, the importance and the value of it. Yeah, I was only interested interested in that in relationship to some of the work because it seems to me that there's there are also other things going on. Yeah. That simply has to do with the wall element here and the, the your ability to discover opportunities both on the, it, that is a combination of, of formal geometry and material properties. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, I know this guy's like like Annie and and Greg, you know, I mean the the, the exhibition, you know, the American Pavilion at the uh, at the, that, you know, I mean, I felt like I was in a historical show, you know, and not that I'm, you know, that formalism is bad, but why, why not adapt, you know, why not evolve, why can't that, you know, you know, like, you know, if, if you took Jonah Friedman here and you took Greg Lynn and you met somewhere, I mean, you'd have something pretty interesting, I think, you know, and it seems rigid, okay, maybe in terms of its formal effect, but also in its ability to react to other conditions. I mean, like client sounds, but I mean, this is more than client, right? I mean, you have political, <laughs> and it's, you know, okay, social architecture, or factories are social, but um, it seems like you would want that kind of curiosity and that agility in your practice that it could um, transform. And we're talking, you know, what, 20 years now? So that would be the sad part for me. <laughs> and maybe, you know, maybe I don't understand the practices precisely enough, but, you know, from the outside looking in, that would be my observation. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.
of the beer. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. Oh, are you showing those old projects? What are you like? <laughs> but I never, I never know what, you know, like, we try to tie it, tie it together. And we always see new things, old things. Let's see if I can catch one from Moscow. Yeah. Yeah. Is this is this one yours? This is yeah. yours, isn't it? Yeah.